That's ancient technology that like cost them a bundle now to support Python. Their terminal competitor was uh, the proper information So thank you everybody for coming along again to our second San Francisco meetup. Uh, I'm going to be giving a brief introduction to KDB Plus, um, so hopefully some of you will gain something from it. I know a lot of you here already know about it, but you know, let's get the show started. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Fintan Quill. I'm the Global Head of Sales Engineering at KX. I'm based out of our New York office, but I'm pretty much here almost half time now these days. That's the weather. <laughs> Uh, so just a little bit about KX. Um, we have offices in North America, Europe, and Asia. Uh, we're headquartered out of Palo Alto, and uh, I work in our main New York sales office. Um, we have a very, very large user community. Uh, we have about 4,000 plus people with KDB Plus and Q as a skill set um, on their LinkedIn resumes. Um, we are in the finance industry, the energy utilities industry, and the pharmaceutical industry. Um, we're also in the software industry, the general software industry, um, mm -hmm. where companies are actually embedding KDB Plus in their solutions. And then we're also in um, telco as well. Um, we've pretty much been widely adopted across the financial services industry um, for about 22 years now, since the company started in uh, 1993. Um, so in terms of um, what our products are, so our main product is called KDB Plus, and that's an integrated columnar database and programming system. Um, so what it's all about really is um, doing streaming, real-time, and historical data in the one platform. So it's unlike a lot of other systems where you maybe have one you know, historical data warehouse and then maybe one in-memory data fabric and then maybe a separate streaming um, engine. Um, you can do all three of those um, programming paradigms in one using the one programming language and the one database. And it comes in two different versions. We have a 32-bit version, which is available for free um, for commercial use. So you can build your startup and you know, make millions of dollars doing Snapchat or something like that. Um, um, and then we also have a 64-bit version, which is um, licensed. And there's really no difference between the 32 and 64-bit version other than um, the extra uh, memory addressability. Um, other than that, it's got all of the features of the Cube programming language, so the syntax is exactly the same. You can port your code across and it will run perfectly fine. <coughs> So in terms of some of the features, um, KDB Plus is a pure software solution. So it runs on standard operating systems and hardware. So in terms of the operating systems we have builds available for, um, we have Windows and um, Solaris, both on Spark and Intel. And we also have a Linux build and a Mac OS X build. And so in terms of our customers, I would say about 90 to 95% of our customers are running on Linux and typically Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, and in terms of hardware, then, you know, we run on pretty much uh, most commodity hardware out there. Um, most of our customers will be running on typical Intel chips. Um, but we run on small machines. You know, we've had a build available in the past for the Raspberry Pi, all the way up to a massive supercomputer and everything kind of in between. So, you know, we're pretty much plug and play on, on most commodity hardware. Um, in terms of what we do, it's, it's really in database analytics. Uh, and what I mean by that is you run the queries directly on the data. Uh, so it's unlike a lot of other systems where maybe you extract the data using SQL and then maybe you analyze it in some other statistical programming package such as like MATLAB or Python or R. And with us, because the Q language is very analytically rich, you're running the queries directly on the data. So that has several advantages. And the first advantage is, is you get performance because you're not copying data. And the second advantage is because you're not copying data, then you have a much, much lower memory footprint compared to a lot of other solutions out there. And then because you're running directly on the data and you're not having two different technology stacks, it just makes it easier from a development maintenance um, and you know turnaround perspective because you can just write one piece of code that does all of this stuff and not have to extract it and then analyze it in something else. So it just becomes a very um, powerful paradigm uh, in terms of like you know reducing your total cost of ownership. Um, we also support compression as well. And we support compression in three different facets. Um, the first facet would be over WebSockets. So we have a WebSockets API. 
it's fully compliant with the WebSocket standard, including the WebSockets compression standard. Um, and you can get really, really good compression ratios. In some recent tests that we did, we got about 100 to 200 times compression ratios over WebSockets. And that's because WebSockets is a persistent connection. So it keeps the connection over and you, know, you send the tokens across and you can get really, really high compression ratios. And the second type of compression we support is compression over IPC. Meaning if you've got one um, queue process on one machine talking to another queue process on another machine, you can compress that data before you send it over the wire. So, you know, you help in terms of your network bandwidth. And then the third type of compression that we have is on disk compression. So that can help in two ways. <clears throat> the first way is the most obvious one, you know, in terms of your storage cost, because you just have less hardware, you need to have less storage arrays. Typically, you can get pretty good compression ratios. Uh, we support a couple of different compression algorithms. We have our own native algorithm, which is um, very fast for decompression. Um, and then we support a GZIP algorithm as well, where you can get really high compression ratios. And it supports all of the 10 different um, GZIP algorithms. And you can also actually buy a compression hardware card that can help with the, um, the GZIP. Um, and also the second advantage with the compression is, is typically if you're running on a very, very slow disk, it means then that you're just reading less data in off disk. So if, as I say, if you're running on a slow disk, you can just get better performance because then you're just doing, you're, you're moving the bottleneck into the CPU. Um, so we also support parallelism and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but at a very, very high level, we support multi-core, multi-threading, um, multi-server, um, multi-machine, so we can run on you know a large cluster of machines now, and that's something that we've put a lot of work into in the last few years, so you can run KDB Plus in a kind of a shared all or a shared nothing type of environment. Uh, but also, even within a machine as well, we can take advantage of all of these massive uh, multi-core machines now. So if you've got, like say, a 30 or 40 core machine, you can you know run a massively parallel calculation and you'll typically get near linear performance. Um, and then in terms of the interfaces that we have available, uh, we have many different interfaces. As mentioned already, we have a WebSockets interface. And we also have JDBC and ODBC for connecting to other database sources. And then we also have APIs available for most common programming languages. So C, C++, C Sharp, Java, Python, Perl, um, R, etc. And so, you know, many of these APIs are um, freely available. Um, some of them we support and then some of them are just available on GitHub. So in terms of a typical sample architecture of a KDB Plus implementation, um, this kind of represents most of the facets that you have. Um, so you have your data here on the left-hand side coming in. So that could be coming in from a market data feed handler or a smart meter exchange or maybe even a Bitcoin exchange. And typically that would be coming um, from a, a feed handler, which would be you know, typically in a compiled language such as C, C++ or something like that. Uh, and that will, you know, parse the data and then it will um, open a connection to the KDB Plus events engine or sometimes that's known as the ticker plant in the finance world. And the events engine is basically, you can consider it as a data distribution engine uh, that works via publish subscribe mode. Um, so the first thing that the events engine does when it gets the data is it logs it down to disk to a transaction log file. And you typically have that running on a very, very fast um, local disk or a solid state drive. And the reason for that is, is that you have these downstream in-memory processes. So if they go down for whatever reason, somebody kills them or um, something like that, then you can replay the data from the log file while the messages are buffered up in the events engine. So that means then you get full recovery if your data goes down. Um, and the simplest example of a subscriber to the events engine would be the real-time database. And the real-time database basically just subscribes for everything. It's basically it just it's like a fire hose. It just says, give me everything to the events engine. And the events engine just pushes everything down. Uh, and the real-time database in some ways is a bit of a dumb process. It basically takes the data and just appends it to its in-memory tables. It takes the data, appends it. So this grows larger and larger. Um, but then you might have more sophisticated, you know, dedicated engines as well, which we call streaming query engines, or you know, a few years ago this would have been known as complex event processing. Um, and those streaming query engines might be doing a very, very specific task. So um, in the finance world, it might be doing something like calculating a volume weighted average price for a specific set of stocks. Or maybe in the smart meter space, it might maybe be calculating like the average kilowatt hour, hour usage for maybe a specific zip code or something like that. So it will specify like a specific table and a specific set of you know symbols or you know subscribes uh, subscriptions that it wants to get, and it will only get that data rather than the whole data like the real time database gets. And then as the data is coming in, even before it's tabulated, you can actually do some calculations, and then you can maybe push it into a very very small in memory table. So you'll have one row essentially per subscription. 
So this means then that it's much, much faster when you hit this because you're not actually querying anything. You're just getting the result back. So it's instantaneous. Whereas a real-time database, you're having to you know, run the query. So essentially, you're doing the aggregation, which is still quite fast in its own right because it's still running in memory. Um, but the streaming query engine, typically, you're just going to get instantaneous performance. Um, and then typically what happens is um, at a pre-configured interval, in most cases, it's usually at end of day or something like that. And the events engine will send a message to all of its downstream subscribers. And in the case of the real-time database, what it does is it basically saves all of its um, contents down to one shard or one partition on disk. And then it just deletes its in-memory tables and it's ready then for the new day or the new time period, whatever that may be. Uh, and that time period is just specified by one command line flag. So it's very, very straightforward. You don't have to write any particularly complex code for this. Um, so then the historical database then basically has everything but today's data. So that means then if you're querying today's data for like say a trading firm or something like that, they're gonna want really, really fast access. So that's why we kind of keep that hot data as it were in memory. Um, but then the historical data, maybe you're kind of willing to accept a little bit more of a latency hit. So then you have that out on disk. But the nice thing about the historical database is, is that it can take advantage of the operating system file cache. So if you go and you query, say, yesterday's data, and then you go back and you query it again, it will likely be cached in memory, so then you subsequently get in-memory performance. <clears throat> and the data layout um, between the in-memory database and the on-disk database is very, very similar. So it means then you can build you know, a kind of an overall global view of things, and you can tie your data very, very easily together, obviously just using the one programming language as well. Okay, so what I'm going to go do now, do now is actually go back and discuss a little bit um, the actual Q language and uh, I'm going to go back in time to the 1960s to an exceptional gentleman uh, by the name of Ken Iverson. Um, so he created the language APL, um, which is kind of where everything comes from. Uh, and he won uh, an award, the um, Turing Award in 1979 for his um, exceptional paper, Notation as a Tool of Thought. And the URL is here, and I highly recommend it for those of you that haven't read it before. It's a really exceptional read, and it, it really puts a lot of just simple ideas in front of your face, and it's, it's kind of like a wow moment, and then you just think, wow, things are a lot simpler than we kind of make them out to be. Um, um, but there were some issues with the APL programming language. It was very, very terse, um, but also it had its own specific keyboard. Um, so it had all of these kind of like hieroglyphic um, Greek style symbols. Um, so as useful as they were and, and as terse and as compact and maintainable as they made the code, um, you know, obviously computers evolved and kind of the day of the mainframe kind of went away. Um, so then what happened after this is this, this um, dapper gentleman came along with his... Um, Silicon Valley uniform of the black turtleneck. Uh, <laughs> um, so Arthur Whitney, he's the KX co-founder, and he basically was Ken's protege in many ways. Um, so he came up with several languages then. So A, A+, J, and then K, which became the precursor to the Q language. And um, so his ideas behind this were essentially to take all of the similar ideas that Ken Iverson had built up with the APL programming language and basically port them across into the ASCII keyboard. So instead of using you know, all these you know, complex hieroglyphic type characters, he just used a standard ASCII keyboard, but he kept a lot of the same you know, um, principles in mind. Um, so then um, the language K came along. And, and for those of you that know K, that this is the Sudoku solver. So it's, we think it's the shortest Sudoku solver um, worldwide. Um, but then after this, then what came along is the, the Q language. So the Q language is a more kind of like wordier version of the K language because some people thought even this is, you know, a little too complex. But, you know, more and more people still like using the K language as well. So it's, it's, it's still around. <laughs> um, but the Q programming language then, what does that kind of compose of? So it composes of a functional programming language, so similar to APL was a functional error. And then you've also got the concept of arrays and vectors. Um, but then on top of that uh, with Q, you had a, the concept of a query language. So K basically had um, the functional programming. Um, so the previous product was called KDB, and that had the K language, but it also had a second language called KSQL. Uh, um, so then when Q came along, um, Arthur merged the ideas of K and KSQL into one programming language. So this is where you get the functional and kind of the array vector style semantics of Q. But then you also get the query style semantics of, of a SQL-like language. 
And then um, it's also an interpreted language as well. So you can just, you know, type the commands at the console, the results come back straight away. So it's, it's very good if you're doing prototyping or just quick development of projects. You can get it done very, very fast. You don't have to compile stuff and, you know, wait for it to run, etc. You, you usually get the answer pretty much instantaneously. And it's also a time series programming language as well. And that, you know, sometimes people kind of wonder, like, what do you mean by that? And essentially, what I mean by that is that we have, you know, native support for time series. It's not like an afterthought, like a lot of other programming languages where they store like dates and timestamps as strings, and then they try and do meaningful analytics and they wonder why it's so slow. Uh, with KDB Plus, we have enhanced, you know, temporal data types. So we can store data um, down to nanosecond precision, millisecond precision, date, month, year, hour, second. And and, and we can convert between those types really, really fast. So that means it's really good if you're doing aggregations on data that I want to get, you know, my data stored in nanoseconds, but I want to get like a five minute running average or something like that. So that casting can be done exceptionally fast. So it means that you can do a lot of really, really fast time series on the fly analytics, unlike a lot of other solutions. So in terms of some of the types of syntax that you can get in the Q programming language, this is a very um, simple sample Q query. So for those of you familiar with SQL, this isn't a, you know, a large jump in terms of syntax. Um, so we are just selecting the open, which we define as the first price. Um, so the colon operator is just the assignment operator in the Q language. So this would be similar to say, select first price as open. Um, and then you have the high, which is the maximum price, the low, which is the minimum price, and then the close, which is the last price from trade. And then where your date is 2013, 0501, and the symbol equals Apple. Um, so the only major syntax difference there is this um, symbol notation that we have. So it's a, a symbol or varchar data type, which just has the back tick because we didn't want to, you know, why put an extra character at the end? Um, and, and this is the type of query you get. So the, the first max and the min and the last are all inbuilt functions in the Q language. Um, and there's many, many um, array-based functions as well. This is just, you know, touching uh, the tip of the iceberg. <clears throat> so then in terms of like comparing Q versus standard SQL, as mentioned earlier, Q is you know a vector in a columnar database, so it has native support for vectors and, and column store. So it means you rarely have to ever write a loop in, in the Q language. Um, and Q also, as it's a time series database, it comes with order defined, which is obviously, compare this to, to SQL, where it supports rows and records, and then it also doesn't really infer order. You have to infer it, you know, specifically. And so, in my opinion, what this does is it makes Q a lot more intuitive and concise, which um, thus then leads to higher productivity and less maintenance. Uh, and this is just a you know a sample query um, on the on the typical you know suppliers and parts database, which is kind of you know database 101 as it were. Um, so the at the top here you see the Q query where we're doing an aggregation, and um, we're also doing a foreign key join. So we're joining the suppliers table with the parts table, and then we have the fact table, which is the supplier parts table. Um, but then you can compare that with the SQL query, which is basically like two and a half lines. Um, and you just look at the syntax and it just doesn't seem particularly intuitive. I mean, they're mentioning color three times here. I mean, when do you do a group by an aggregation and you don't pull in the aggregate column? So why not just actually pull it inside the select statement, which is what we do in the Q language, so you don't need to write color out three times unnecessarily. And then we have the idea of this dot notation. So the P dot color then references back to the parts table and pulls the color column from that. Um, so it's a very, very simple syntax compared to the SQL equivalent. So I think, you know, obviously like any language, it takes a little bit of a learning curve to get used to. But I think with examples like this, you see just how intuitive the programming language can be. And then as a result, how productive it can be and how easy it can be to maintain compared to, you know, very, very clunky SQL code. And this is another interesting type of query. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, KDB Plus has very, very good time series support. So um, we have um, what we call bitemporal joins in KDB Plus. And what I mean by that is if you're joining two different time series data sets, which don't necessarily align. Um, so we have this join, which we call the as of join for AJ. And it basically takes three parameters. The first parameter to your um, function or join function is basically the column that you want to join between the two tables. Tables. So we're, we're doing this um, as of join on the time column. And um, so then the second parameter here, what we're doing is we're pulling the data from our trade table. And then the third example, we pull the data from our quote table. 
And, and, and if you think about it in practice, you know, the trades and the quotes um, from a financial system, or this could be data coming from a smart meter system as well. You could be joining weather data with smart meter data and time series aren't necessarily always aligned. So if you try and join them using a typical SQL join, you're probably just going to lose your data because, you know, the times don't match. Whereas what the Q language will do in this scenario is it will take um, your trade and then it will look into the quote table and it will say, give me the quote, uh, the trade value as of that time. So it will basically look back into your quote table and it will find the value. And there's also actually an expansion of this function called a w join, a window join as well, which is um, wj is the syntax for that. And uh, basically you pass in an extra parameter which specifies a window of time before or after an event occurs. So that can be very, very powerful as well for doing all sorts of like time series analysis. And then we move on to parallelization in Q, um, which we'll hear a little bit more about in a few minutes from Jay. <clears throat> um, but basically, Q has a very, very simple uh, you know, multi-threaded API. You essentially pass it the number of slave threads or slave processes as a command line parameter. And then to parallelize your functions, then the first example here is a complex function in curly uh, parentheses. And then we're doing it each over a vector of eight items of eight very large numbers. And then in the second example here, we're doing the same thing, except you notice that we have an extra P here in front of the each, which just means parallel each. So there you go. There's your multi-threaded API. So if you compare that to a lot of other programming languages where they have very heavy and clunky you know, parallelization um, APIs, KDB Plus, it's all done under the hood. So the user just has to specify the number of slave threads or slave processes they want to run. And then they just parallelize it using Peach. So it's very, very simple. Um, so now in terms of some uh, useful resources, um, as some of you know, if you go to kx.com, you'll see the free 32-bit download. So you can go there, give your name and address, choose your operating system, and you can download it. It's you know a couple of hundred kilobytes in size, very, very low memory footprint, and you can start coding straight away. It's, you, know, you can download and be coding within 20 seconds. And then we've also got a wiki page. So if you go to code.kx.com, um, there's many, many resources here. So it describes every single function with examples. It describes all of the APIs available. Um, there's a different cookbooks available for if you're loading like CSV data or JSON data and stuff like that. And there's user contributed code from uh, people like Jay and also Yang available there as well. And then we've got our uh, blog page. So we've got kxcommunity.com. Um, we see Arthur up here once again. Um, and so we have like regular blogs being posted there and on all sorts of news going on in, in the world of KX and KDB+. And then we also have a, a publicly available Google group. Um, so it's the, the personal KDB Plus Google group. And we have just over 1,000 members on that group and these days and then we also have a, a private forum for um, our commercially licensed users as well called the k4 list box and they're great places to go if you've got a question you know you'll get an answer back pretty much within a few minutes and uh, so it's, it's you know it's pretty high volume and it's, it's very very in interesting and it's a great place to look um, and see if somebody's you know had this problem before you search for the answer or you just ask the question yourself and then we also started a GitHub repository just a, a couple of weeks ago. So if you go to kxsystems.github.io, um, you'll see this uh, page here. And there's many, many user contributed code now. There's, I think there's about 30 plus projects available on the page. So you can just go in, download this. So there's all sorts of things from you know APIs to visualization tools uh, and other such items. Uh, and it's all really, really cool stuff. So And there's more and more of it coming as well so it's a great place to go if you don't want to reinvent the wheel and you know write a kdb plus infrastructure from scratch you can take uh, and pick and choose some of these pieces of code and it can be up and running within no time and then recently a, a book was released um by a gentleman named nick saras who's based over in hong kong and he's been using kdb plus uh, from a trading perspective for many many years now so he released the book q tips just over a month ago now and it has, um, it's available in paperback format, <clears throat> but you can also get it in an Amazon and a Kindle edition and, and also Kindle Unlimited as well. Uh, and it's very much coming from a practical viewpoint where he's showing like real world examples of how to set up a KDB Plus architecture and stuff. And it's, it comes highly recommended. And then there's also another interesting um, link as well um, from the Stack Benchmarks. So Stack is the Securities Technology Analysis Center. They're based just outside Chicago. 
and they do independent financial technology benchmarks where they verify the results, they run the tests in their lab. And um, KX are involved in what's known as the M3 benchmark, which for, is for historical um, financial time series database benchmarks. Um, so the benchmark involves about 16 or 17 different analytical calculations run on databases of different size. So a one terabyte database to a 10 terabyte database and a much larger database again. Uh, and KX has been run on uh, various different types of hardware solutions. So if you're a hardware junkie, it's a really good place to go and, and download the results and see how um, KDB Plus runs on, say, Intel chips um, versus you know AMD chips, or maybe Haswell and you know Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge, and then also the different types of network interconnects, um, and then also the different types of storage solutions. So whether you're using you know something like a DRAM SSD or a non-volatile DIMM or just the standard spinning rust um, and then also there's other um, types of solutions out there as well so it's, it's a really good place to look to see how does kdb plus run on a different type of hardware stack and then also obviously there's our meetups page so if you go to kx.meetup.com you'll see a list of all of the meetups worldwide so we have them in 55 plus cities now um, so if ever you're going on a vacation and feel like having a bit of kx um, feel free in any of these you know, uh, interesting locations to, to join one. I noticed there's South African one there. I didn't even know there was a South African one. So there we go. <laughs> um, so that's about it for me. So I'll hand it over to Jay now, who will show us some nice multi-threaded code. Thank you very much. OK. I have four core machine here. And I will start my demo. And it will warm up a little bit. Start with one thread. And James Brown again, one, two, three, four. And then it'll jump into, well, give me everything. And then I'll do the backflip in your imagination. Oops, that's not the thing I wanted to show you first. This is. So. One is kicking up here, 11 threads running on the K KDB. Four threads are kicked in, busy, pretty busy, CPU up there. Now, jump into eight threads, all running here, because there are, there are eight threads, they are eating each, you know, is running with 50% of CPU. And all CPUs are maxed out. And I'm going to stop the older threads by sending them, ah, stop, stop, stop. And, um, you know, and that's done. So you have seen multi-threaded queue uh, running under your control. And this is not the same as what Minton showed you of doing a peach operation. And I'm going to then talk more about this. So Q in every core, just like chicken in every pot. And I have a fairly pretentious, to be honest, pretentious subtitle. Uh, but maybe I'll reach there, or maybe I won't. So Q, as you know, is mostly speaking single-threaded for writing and multiple-threaded for reading. That has been true from a you know, very, very, very long time. And there is even a very good paper by Apta, Shasha, and Whitney uh, talking about why that particular architecture was chosen. And that's because it precludes awful lot of issues dealing with concurrency. And if you've ever done any P-thread style concurrency, you know how painful it is to get anything right. But Q also has IPC. IPC, well, there are two meanings of IPC in general, right? Uh, in Unix world, IPC means uh, you have two processes or more running in the same host. And uh, if you're talking to another remote host, then people say RPC for remote proce procedure calls. But IPC, Q, Q's IPC covers both grounds. So what Q has is that I can, you know, you start another process process somewhere else, either on your machine or somewhere else, some, an, another machine, 
and you talk to the process, and you can talk in two different modes, one in the synchronous call, that you make the call and wait for the reply, or asynchronous call. You just send the, you know, some code to the other side and let it come back later, and you'll check the result later when you see fit. And then there are some issues in terms of, hey, do I want to send the whole chunk of data over there, or do I just want to send some code over the other side and tell them to oh, run this code for me with the data that you have and return back some results, right? So there are some good, uh, I say, design operational freedom that you have. But then you think, hmm, data. If I have a lot of data, one I don't want to send over, you know, even with compression and uh, you know fast network and everything. I might want to do shared memories, you know, in a single host, so that two processes can talk, you know, look at the same data, and then you get into shared memory programming, which is not for the weak of heart, but you can do it. It's not really included in Q. You have to do it yourself, uh, but People have done it. I've seen some mention of it. I don't know exact details, though. But I assume that you can do it, and you can, you'll have to deal with all the sorts of concurrency issues that you so far have avoided, and deal with the uh, nitty gritty OS and uh, hardware and tuning and all these things. Then we have an issue of a, you know, N cores that we, uh, multi-core era that we live in. My phone has four cores. This laptop is several years old, has four cores. Uh, I can go out and buy, for a price of a small car, like 200 you know, core machines today, right? Octor Xeon with 36 cores or something like that. 36 you know, hyper-threads. And it'll go on and on and on. In that situation, uh, if your KDB if you're using KDB mostly for you know, massive queries, your pH, I think, works out beautifully. But from time to time, you're not running the queries all the time, and you have the core, you know, cores kind of lying around, then you might want to do something with those cores. And I'm going to skip this uh, P-thread related uh, rant because it's not healthy for you or no me. And then I'm going to talk, I'm just going to throw in a caveat about that what you're trying to do, whatever you try to do, don't try to circumvent whatever KDB has. KDB s still remains single-threaded write operation. And if you try to bypass that, you will be really, really sorry. And in other words, don't, con don't, don't complain to me. That you did something wrong. And uh, you should like, run the KDB in multi-threaded mode uh, in the configuration. That's just giving it minus port number uh, when you start up your KDB. And then this, I'm just, I'll show you this code demonstrating very simple programming model. And this is the code that just ran that you just saw. What I do have here is Pong, which is just a function with two arguments. Pipe and arcs. Pipe is you know, supplied by uh, what calls Pong, and it gets back to what calls Pong. So below, actually, Pong 0, I start with Pong 0 is, I'm just calling a function called new with Pong as an, you know first argument, and some arguments values I'll pass on. So this is my uh, starting a new, spawning a new thread here, so I'm, and then Pong starts running, and Pong says, okay, I'm gonna start up, and I'm gonna wait until I receive ping. Uh, then I'll stop, I'll send ping back and stop, but then until I receive ping, I'll do some work here. And that's what you saw in terms of CPU you know, firing up. So what I do here is then, okay, start my Pong, Pong zero, and then I say, hey Pong, do some work. And what comes in, and hey, it's not pink, so Pong does work, and wait for more. And then I can just repeat sending, Pong, do more work. Okay? And also, 
I started up with not just one pong, pong zero, I started a whole bunch of pongs. Pong, zero, one, two, up to, you know, so I, I started up eight pongs. And then I can do, send them as a, okay, pong zero, do some work. And then I do one, two, three, four. The other ones do some more work. And then I call the rest, you lazy bums, do more work. And then my CPU's all packed and Pong's busy working. And then when I'm done, when I'm okay, so I didn't show, I don't show it here, but here I can say send Pong, this time ping message. And then Pong gets ping and says, ha, ha, free to go home. And Pong shuts down. So then everything shuts down cleanly. Okay? So it's a fairly simple programming model. All I do is I spawn a new thread, and I have a control handle pipe there, so I, I can send controlling message back, back and forth. So in, inside the Pong, I have to have some logic how to respond to the controlling message. But then the message here, implied message here, is that multi-threaded programming is heck of a lot simpler in this fashion. You're not joining threads. You're not getting into like, oh, I have to have, all, have a mutex and I have to get into critical region. Oh no, I have to have two mutexes together. Oh, which order do I you know, lock and unlock? What if, if I deadlock across the two threads? Oh, what if, if I have stay rise? Oh no, all these pro problems were the actually original reasons why you know, KDB started as single-threaded writes because all these problems are nasty, nasty problems, so hard to get right and so on. But with this style of multi-threaded programming, much of the problem goes away. Okay, again, simple programming model. I just wanted to emphasize that. So I just replace the word pong with just funk. You know, so whatever function you have. And um, I, instead of using word control, I just, I'm just saying here, control, control, okay, send control, some message, don't stop, you know, whatever message you send back and forth. It's the same, same deal. And I'm just starting a function. That's all I'm doing. Okay, slightly more. Inside, okay, syntactically, I think I have a mistake somewhere here, but then never mind. Inside, the, inside whatever function I define, I can write some more code that says, hey, um, a function starts up with uh, some initial argument. Then initial argument, you can use it to kind of configure your function, con con configure your environment, whatever. And inside the code, you can have, it can be a pops up code, you know, reply, request, reply style code, or whatever else to get some you know, chunk of data you want to compute with this function into the function and out of the function. So I just elided that with you know, italic code. And you have some freedom to do that. And now we're getting to slightly esoteric territory, but I think uh, this is where the, so far, what I've shown is all very, very, very possible with, you know, you can do it with C, you can do it with Python, and so on, and so on, you know. Okay, Python too, yeah. But this is hard to do with, say, C or C++, or even Java. The, the reason is, when I say, this time I named my function just compute, imaginative, and I'm just putting in, you know, start your compute with this, Thunk, whatever it is, right? But then if you think about it, I can even, I can push anything that Q supports, any data type, Q supports into the thunk and then go through the computation with the thunk. So I'm not just moving data around, I'm, I can move my code around too. Basically, what I've so far kind of told you in an abstract fashion is that you can, you have a full control as to, hey, control messaging, how do you control your code, how you, what kind of data it works on, how data gets there or not. Uh, 
and you can do even advanced stuff like I am just define some kind of protocol of how my application or how my computation works and how I deal with the data and so on and throw them around freely. And these two points of the control and data flow, freedom designing control and data flow and integrating them nicely is now actually done with open source library called Zero MQ. Some of you may have heard about it and it's getting more and more popular. Uh, it's basically a very, very high level socket, network socket programming um, library. And, but then what Q brings into the table, because the Q is functional language where everything is a value that you can pass around, you have a, you can do some advanced programming style to suit your need. And if I want to pass around my functions or the code in say something like C, that would be a little bit of a nightmare. Or even Java, that would be a nightmare because boilerplate would be so much. So basically, what I shown you is basically marrying a zero MQ, which is just a transport layer with lots of options for um, laying out your data network. And CZMQ is done by the same people who done zero MQ, but it gives you somewhat higher level uh, binding of this functionality. And it also gives you this multi-thread programming API and I, QZMQ is the Q bindings so that you can use CZMQ library from Q. And I just put it up to GitHub. Uh, it's open source and it just gives you one more freedom to you know, design your architecture because you can move not just data around, you can also move code. You know, whether you, you do it everything right with that freedom is well, it's up to you. And since you guys have been nice, I'll just show you one more demo. It's the same as the echo you know, before, but this time I'm just, I just create a dictionary. There are a bunch of keys, you know, sync, act, neck, quit, you know, just random words. Um, and each has some related code in here for that in the dictionary. I just pass the dictionary to my protocol actor. And then in the code, what I'm doing is, uh, hey, uh, is command is what I receive from my pipe, from my control. And there is a command, uh, well, do I, do I have the legit you know, protocol word from, you know, in the command? Then they say, okay. Then, then I say, hey, okay, that's nice. Then I'll just run the thing. And then if not, I quit. So this is uh, where magic is happening. I get the protocol, which is this. I just look up the protocol for the command I receive and uh, I launch the code in the dictionary corresponding to the command. Application protocol as you see fit. Try to do that with your whatever else. Then protocol design is one thing, protocol implementation is another thing. People get both wrong and until, you know, they, won't, they don't realize until too late. The benefit here in, in the what, where Q is really, really, really strong here is that I can write it in an interpreter, right? I can just try out my protocol as a simple dictionary, add one word, you know, add a little bit of code, match that code, and fiddle with it, run through, whatever. I don't even need this whole thing to actually, because all I have to do is just define protocol, you know, find the matching code, run it, see what happens, and so on. I can play with it, and that will be, the, my play time will be much, much shorter than your compile time with some other you know, languages out there. So I think this is 
very powerful, maybe all too powerful. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I can understand why, you know, for example, Arthur will be very, very, very much, you know, be careful not to put multi-threading inside the, inside the KDB itself. I very much understand that. I mean, that's the right thing. But this is just a library. Uh, so you can just add on and you know, you know, see if it fits your architecture or not, and play with it. Okay, so that's my story. Thanks. So basically, this was kind of demo I did last time around, showing you how to do the plotting from the tool itself without leaving. So going to end up, you know, going to put up some pretty pictures. So, <laughs> thank you.